Hello, my friends, and welcome to this edition of News Hound. So we're here today uh, to discuss the fifth part, or look through the fifth part of the Black Hand series, which is about the original Jeffrey Epstein. And I don't choose that name lightly. I'm not saying that term uh, just for the sake of saying stuff. No, in actual fact, there was once a man who was uh, similar to Jeffrey Epstein in almost every single way. He uh, lived in uh, Palm Beach um, and uh, had a house in New York and Paris, um, one in Britain. Uh, in Britain, he used to get Stephen Ward to act as his Ghislaine Maxwell to go out on the streets, along with his other staff that used to do it in America, to hunt down girls who were under the age of 18 that he could have sex with. And that's how similar. He also had his own island resort, which he called Paradise Island, and was set up for sex parties of the elite and rich and famous, just like Jeffrey Epstein. He even uh, designed a flag for that island that was a P, just a P. And Huntington Hartford, as we will learn, liked his girl's prime. Mariella Novotny was too old for him when she was 18. Okay? So we're entering into a a, a, um, a world where you're going to see loads of similarities. Uh, this billionaire philanthropist uh, with loads of connections to the deep state going around the world. Now, Hunted and Hartford isn't as um, intelligent as Jeffrey Epstein, by far. But he is as connected as Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and he uh, did less of the financial crimes, less of the behind the scenes sort of like um, uh, connecting people up, middleman type work. Instead, he was someone who ran elite sex parties and other things and wanted to do it the best as possible. Now, he had a very interesting life. We're going to look through some of that life now. And some of it will make you go, oh, my God. And this may be a little bit of a long one. So let us see what happens when I share the screen. Pops up, pops. Huntington Hartford. Yes. So he even looks a bit like Jeffrey Epstein, doesn't he? He's got that same sort of, like, look about him as Jeffrey Epstein. And here he is next to Andy Warhol, Warhol probably at Studio um, 54, whatever it was called. Um, he was always in amongst the art world, and um, he was always with this little look on his face, a little wry smile, like, I've seen something else I'm going to hump. And we're starting off today, when we look at this, in Vanity Fair. And this is a really important article. Um, it's one that attempts to set, it's called Hostage to Fortune. And it says, um, and as you see, this is from December 2004 said, after squandering his vast AMP inheritance, Huntington Hartford turned to drugs, then vanished from sight, finding the 93-year-old former playboy in Lyford K. The author learns about his gilded past, his dark years as a recluse, and how his daughter, Juliet, came to his rescue. Really, really interesting stuff. Right, okay. I'm not sure if we're going to go into this later. Um... But if we don't, uh, then it, it, it's within the article um, proper. But his daughter, Juliet, who he speaks of there, um, started having uh, sex uh, reportedly, her own admission, when she was about 14, uh, 13, 14. Um, and she brags about having sex with Mick Jagger. Now, I don't know if that was when she was under uh, the age of consent, but... Uh, one thing I'd say about Jagger and the Rolling Stones, if you've ever read uh, the, um, what's it called, uh, Marianne Faithful, is that her name, um, book from, I think it must have been about 
it must have been in the 90s sometime um, that she released that. She was around the same time she released it. She was actually in a Metallica video as well. Um, and she uh, talks about the famous Mars bar party where there was a raid and police like storm in and she's walking down uh, the stairs with a Mars bar in a, a vagina. Um, and so the Rolling Stones were well known as being um, sexually deviant in some ways and naughty and all of these things. It's very interesting that Hunted and Hartford's daughter, Juliet, talks about that. Now, she also ends up with going out with the son of Adnan Khashoggi, the famous arms smuggler uh, that is revolving around Jeffrey Epstein's circles as well. Isn't that interesting? They all mix in the same circles. But this issue uh, of Vanity Fair from 2004 shows this hostage to fortune. And uh, let, let's read a little bit of it. I'm not going to read this whole article. I'm going to go through his life um, in different ways. But this will give you an idea. The photographs and newspaper clippings, yellowed with age, lies scattered on Huntington Hartford's bed, reminders of time long gone, of a time long gone. There is Hartford with the surrealist painter Salvador Dali at the nightclub in New York in 1960s, and Hartford um, in black tie with Duke and Duchess of Windsor in 1964. There is Hartford with Errol Flynn at El Morocco in 1957, with Richard Nixon in 1962, and two years later with the Beatles on the beach near his home on Paradise, the Bahamian island he once owned. Lying in his queen-sized bed, the sun streaming into the bedroom of his house in the Bahamas enclave of Lyford K. Hunted and Hartford picks up one photograph after the other with gnarled, claw-like hands and studies them carefully. Today, he is 93 and bedridden, and he has lived in near isolation for the last 10 years. But the photographs are bringing back memories. There are Hartford's friends, now long dead, the heir, John Jacob Astor the Six, Charlie Chaplin, and the society tennis champion, Frank Shields, and Hartford's business rivals, Howard Hughes and Aristotle Onassis. And there are the women, Doris Duke, Barbara Hutton, Lana Turner, and Marilyn Monroe, the heiresses and movie stars with whom Hartford was romantically linked over the years. Slowly, he sifts through the piles of photos again, and then puts them down on a white quilted coverlet. Oh. Yeah, he says after a long silence. I knew them all. I knew everybody in those days. In those days, Huntington Hartford was one of the richest men in America. To uh, uh, The heir to the vast A&P fortune, he had a home uh, then in Cape Antibes, Antibes, Palm Beach and London, as well as a 248-acre in Los Angeles and a 13-room 30, 30 duplex on Beacon Place in Manhattan. An author, a collector, a developer, and a patron of the arts. He was a man with so much money that he could and did buy almost everything he wanted. Forty years ago, the New York Times covered the opening of an art museum he founded in Manhattan. We're probably going to see that paper, actually. As the Times and almost every paper in the country covered most of Hartford's exploits, in 1962, reporters wrote breathlessly of the opening of a new resort on Paradise Island, just as they had heard uh, had about the 1954 opening of Huntington Hartford's Theatre, the first legitimate theatre in Los Angeles in nearly 30 years. In the early 1950s, they chronicled the happenings at the 145-acre artist colony he founded in Santa Monica Mountains, where Edward Hopper, the Pulitzer Prize-winning composer, Ernst Tock were res artists in residence, and they later followed their crusades against vulgarity in the arts, in which he denounced William Faulkner, Tennessee Williams, Pablo Picasso, and modernism in general. And in 1961, he launched Show, a sleek magazine of the arts and cultures. Uh, they covered that too. Hartford was famous then as a very embodiment 
of a more gilded American age. His many marriages and divorces made the headlines. He was a fixture in New York and Hollywood society, holding court night after night at Ciro's, the Stork Club, or Elmo's, always surrounded by an armada of young women. 2,000 guests flew to Bahamas on private jets for the opening night party of Paradise Island Resort. Firework experts were brought in from Monaco. The hotel rooms were filled with white roses. What's he going to do for an encore, the Daily News gushed. Versailles? 20 years later, it was all gone. The resort, the artist colony, the museum, show gone too, was most of Hartford's fortune. Nearly $500 million in today's dollars spent. In 1989, Huntington Hartford gave his last interview. Strung out on drugs, he lay curled in the fetal position, barely conscious, in a bedroom of Manhattan townhouse. He shared with the junkies and desolate hangers-on who were the only companions he had left. And then he disappeared. A lot more to that article. Well worth a read. Of course, it's sourced within um, the article about Hunted and Hartford. Let's... Uh, Go down a little bit and see if he's got any uh, more picks. Usually they've got a pick or two. I mean, they've only got the one of Andy Warhol with Hunted and Hartford at the top. And you see, it's a very long article, this. Very long. We don't have any other more picks. And Hunted and Hartford was an extremely uh, interesting person. This is Time Magazine work now. So we're just at Vanity Fair. And uh, the reason I'm coming here is we're going to start at the beginning, aren't we? Aren't we, friends? In this news hound, we're going to start at the beginning, aren't we? Yes, we are. Okay, so in 1959, they opened their first store, the Great American Tea Company on Manhattan's Vesey Street. Now, this is uh, some of the, the, the stories um, of this rising of this tea empire. Yes, a tea empire. I'm going to drink a cup of tea. So even the thought of tea has made me thirsty for my own tea, which you see me drinking out of this cup. is nearly always English breakfast tea. Sorry about that, people. Mm. Soon the company spread. I'm going to skip a bit. Soon the, soon the company spread. On the profits, the tea company opened new red-fronted stores in towns, started wagon routes to sell teas and spices to farm wives, changed the company's name to the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. Partner Gilman soon sold out and retired on his profits, but Hartford plugged on. Yes. Hartford did plug on. And which Hartford are they talking about? They're talking about... George Huntington Hartford the first. We, of course, just heard a little bit about the life of George Huntington Hartford the second. Now, he's not the son of George Huntington Hartford the first. He's the grandson of George Huntington Hartford the first. And George Huntington Hartford the first was one of the founders of the Great Pacific Tea Company, Great Atlantic Pacific Tea Company, known as A and P. And AMP, uh, one of the biggest companies in the world, it was the first uh, creator of stores, of grocery stores, of chain supermarkets. So that idea first happened with AMP. Hartford, the f first, was like, and his his partners set up what uh, were basically supermarkets. Um, and there's some interesting stuff, of course. We, we, we learn about the reason that I'm showing you this, not only tell you how Hunted and Hartford uh, II made all his money, because he didn't make all his money, he inherited it, of course. He had inherited it from his father, Edward Hunted and Hartford. And so he's mentioned here Hartford's youngest son, Edward, did not care for the grocery business. This is Hunted and Hartford II's father. One Hartford ought to be a gentleman, he said and went to Stevens Institute, the only one of the three boys to go to college. All the rest went straight into the business. Edward, who died in 1922, so that's, uh, I think, 11 years after Hunter and Hartford II's born, his son's born, made his fortune in his own right by manufacturing the Hartford shock absorber. But John, 
early uh, uh but john early proved his business sense with when his mother offered him two cents a dozen for every fly he killed in the house he went and caught a whole jar full at 16 john began cleaning ink wells and sweeping floors at bessie street for his father he got five dollars a week but his frugal mother uh, made him pay one dollar board and put another dollar in the bank says john we got two dollar raise like a champ i told my mother and she raised my board one dollar young george was just as frugal as his mother he it was he who started trimming costs by getting a and p to manufacture its own products when George learned that baking powder consisted of only soda and carbonate, he screened off part of Vesey Street store and set up a chemist uh, to turning it out. But it was bold, adventurous. John, who gave A.M.P. a big shove and made the continent spanning um, in, in fact as well as name. Oh, God, that's a poorly written. Anyway, this talks about A.M.P. Uh, originally, I think, called Red Circle Gold Leaf or whatever. And uh, Hunted in Hartford, like I say, he was born um, and his dad died when he was quite young. And his mother was a bit of a, a, a strange one. A strange one indeed. A strange one indeed. I'm going to see if um, there's a note about his mother in here. I think there is. Do, 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 do. But, um, ah, here you go. We can tell. Furious because his brothers would not help him financially. So this is about his father we were just speaking about. And it says, furious about his brothers could not help him financially. Edward eventually broke off contact with them. So George Huntington Hartford II's father broke off contact with the rest of the family who were running A&P because Edward didn't want to run it. And in the years before his death, in 1922, he withdrew his children, uh, he withdrew from his children as well. So years before he died, he didn't even see Hunted and Hartford. Uh, so Hunt, as Josephine Bryce calls him, um, I don't think Hunt ever saw him at all, uh, said Hartford's sister, Josephine Bryce, who died in 1992. As for Hartford, he's now simply Uncle John and Uncle George with tremendously success. As for Hartford, he now says simply Uncle John and Uncle George were tremendously successful and my father wasn't. The younger of Henrietta's two children, Hartford was without question his mother's favor favourite. And after his father's death, she took full charge of his life. She smothered him in a cocoon of mother love, as his sister once put it, to such a degree that even when he was a teenager, she would reach across the table at dinner parties and cut his meat for him. Nothing was too good for her boy. The vain and beautiful South Carolina belle, who her daughter once said, always believed, as southerners do, that she was terribly grand. Henrietta insisted that her son have a car of with his own driver, and when they travelled to Europe, she made sure he had fresh milk sent from New York each week by Cunard steamship. How's it fresh if it gets... Oh, well, anyway. She controlled almost every move her sensitive, shy son made. Today, Hartford scowls at the memory. She was domineering, he says, very domineering. From the time he was quite young, Henrietta had told her son that everyone was after him for his money, but probably no one coveted it more than Henrietta herself, because the Hartford Trust skipped a generation. Henrietta had little money of her own. The fortune belonged to her son, and it was with his money that in the 1920s she bought Seaverage, one of Newport's grand uh, seaside estates. From here, she launched her entree into Newport society with dinner parties where the tables were laid with gold, where and liveried butter stood behind each chair. A oh, liveried butler, sorry, he stood behind each chair. Uh, there were those, including the pseudonymous, pseudon, ooh, pseudonymous, pseudonymous, oh my God, look at me, social arbiter, Cholly Knickerbocker, I, I, guess, I guess you could guess what, what he invented, um, who sniffed that she tried too hard. But in 1929, Henrietta's social ambitions were rewarded when she and Huntington became the first Hartfords to be listed in 
the social register. All of which meant little to Hartford, determined that he would attend the right school, Henrietta had him sent off to St. Paul's, New Hampshire, an experience that crushed him. Modelled on Eton and Harrow, St. Paul's was, in those days, a formidable bastion of the American Protestant upper crust. Smaller than the other boys, Hartford was ribbed mercilessly, subjected, one of his wives once said, to humiliations in the communal shower. Mm. Richer than his classmates, he was mocked by students and teachers alike because he came from new money. He was a target of anti-Semitism as well because his grandfather, Henrietta's father, was a Jew. When I asked him about St. Paul's, Hartford's eyes grow wide with a look of fear. He shakes his head over and over. Awful, he says. I was very innocent, 12 years old, and I was uh, sent to a very horrible place. My mother never should have done it he says, his voice raising in distress. The memory disturbs him so much that he has trouble breathing, and Juliet has to stroke his hair to calm him down. I was very innocent, he says, spoilt and innocent, and then I went to St. Paul's six horrible years. Hartford spent most of his time at St. Paul's reading and writing. He played squash and was, and was top-ranked, but that, too, was essentially a loner's activity. He got used to being isolated, said his first wife, Diane Hartford, uh, Juliet's mother. Hunt did many things, but all on his own. He had his own island, his own magazine, his own museum, she says. He learned to be, uh, he learned at an early age to be alone. Hartford married for the first time in 1931, when he was 20 years old, a sophomore at Harvard. When Henrietta heard that he had eloped with Mary Lee Epling, the de a dentist daughter, daughter from West Virginia, she threw herself on the floor and wept. I was a mama's boy, and instinctively I wanted to have a, a little freedom, Hartford once said of his first act of rebellion against his mother, who had hoped he'd marry a tobacco heiress, Doris Duke. But Henrietta was even more horrified by what he did next. Encouraged by Mary Lee, who wanted her husband to do something with his life, Hartford decided, over Henrietta's protests, that commerce was beneath a man of his breeding, to go work um, uh, to go work at a &P. As a Hartford and Harvard graduate, he was expected to get a lofty position at a ps management, but John and George Hartford were determined to discipline their pampered young nephew. When he showed up for work, the AMP's Manhattan headquarters, they assigned uh, to him to uh, the company's statistic department, where he's put in charge of monitoring the sale of bread and pound cake. Um, it's going to say that he didn't last long. Uh, he, he wasn't very happy there. Uh, they didn't mean me. I didn't need them, he says. I had a lot of money. Last thing, I was interested in the grocery business. This is what he did a lot of. So I, I went back to there because that brings us close to this date. So this is the New York Times, uh, Friday, the third, uh, 13th of November, 1936. And here you go. This is the reason, married, what, five years before? A graduate from Harvard, and it, this little piece mentions that an old square rigger sold. The Joseph Conrad is purchased by G. Huntington Hartford. That's George. The Joseph Conrad, one of the few square riggers afloat today, had uh, and owned by Alan J. Villiers, author and sailor of Australia, has been bought by G. Huntington Hartford, one of the Heirs of the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company fortune, it was disclosed yesterday. The sale of the famous three masted full rigger was made through Sparkman and Stevens, Inc., uh, naval architects of 11 East 44th Street. The Joseph Conrad was formerly the Danish government's training ship, George Stage. Um, Mr. Villiers bought it in the summer of 1934 in Copenhagen for a South Sea voyage. He renamed it in honour of the writer of Sea Tales. Uh, Villiers was a very famous uh, sailor at the time and a bit of an establishment boy. And this was where um, uh, George Huntington Hartford started his adventures into sailing. And sailing may have been like an expression of freedom for him to get away from this terrible uh, domineering mother, this past of, of failure, this um, lots of different things that happened back then.
that what he saw as unfair could be left behind him on a sailboat. And this uh, you'd see again and again. Many autumn fates. So next year you see this report. And this is uh, many autumn fates held at hot springs. Picnics, carriages drive and ridging party formed. Halloween dances attended by 300. Hot springs. Uh, Virginia, I suppose. October 31st, Halloween ball. The first days of Indian summer have scattered the fall colony um, all over the countryside on picnics, carriage drives, and on horseback. Among the New Yorkers, carriage driving or horseback riding today were Mr. and Mrs. Alex Dom uh, Domerich, Mr. and Mrs. Marvin Harms, Mr. and Mrs. Clyde. Uh, L. Davis, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Edward S. Rogers, Miss, uh, Mrs. Huntington Hartford, Mrs. George Inglis, and Miss Elizabeth S. Boland. So you notice uh, 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 down here, about 300 attended Halloween ball at the Cascades the first night, given to the benefit of the school cafeteria fund. Mr. and Mrs. G. Huntington Hartford were there with Miss Lily, uh, Leslie E. Bogert. Um, so he was partying in 1937. He was attending the establishment parties. And it isn't a surprise. Who wouldn't attend the st establishment parties, really? Um, it, it, there's lots of reasons why he would be hanging around with this crowd. But we'll see this throughout. He was constantly hanging around with this crowd. And we're going to skip forward a fair few years because he did a lot. I mean, within in the years, don't get me wrong, Huntington Hartford, between the years that I just get there, 1930s to 1950, he did a lot. But we want to get into the juicy era uh, of Huntington Hartford's existence. And the 50s were really the juicy. He'd let go of most of it. He had been um, partying around for years and years. And in uh, the early 50s, he met a young... Um, artist dash uh, actress called Marjorie Steele and if I remember correctly she was working selling cigarettes in a theater to make a bit of extra cash uh, to support her acting career I think in Los Angeles um, and he bought all of his cigarettes uh, all the cigarettes off her so that she, uh, she would go on a date with him um, so obviously he liked her and then they married soon after um, and she she was uh, an interesting lady, successful in in um, many respects. So I'm just going to close a couple of these tabs while I'm at it. Um, uh, but between uh, the 4th of March and about the 7th of March, there's a real push in loads of newspapers to advertise her a lot more. And that's mainly because um, a debut film comes out. But of course, it's because Hunter and Harp has got a load of money, so can pay for people to write some articles about her, probably. So this is one from the Charlotte Observer on the 4th of March. Um, Oh, this is actually February. It says it's up here, Charlotte Observer, 4th of March, but it says 4th of February. Here, so I believe the print more than this. I've never seen that. Never seen them get a date wrong like that on uh, newspapers, uh, archives. Marjorie Steele is also an, is also artist. New York, Marjorie Steele who's at this point Marjorie Hunting and Hartford, but still keeps her actress name, who makes her film debut in Face to Face, is also a well-known artist. Her paintings hang in several museums and galleries in various parts of the United States. Face to Face, a two-episode film based on the famous stories by Joseph Conrad and Stephen Crane, stars James Mason and Robert Preston. So two big actors at the time. It was quite a big actor. Uh, Quite a big thing. And here she is, a couple of days later. Spring skin, tonic, soap, warm water. This is from the record, a couple of days after that. Soap and water, beauty, Marjorie Steele, a movie fame, gives some tips about putting new face forward for spring. She says, resolve right now to treat your complexion to really thorough soap and water care. Don't limit the face washing to a quick sudsing, but do a complete job with a washcloth or complexion brush. 
remember to give special attention to areas where makeup tends to cake, at the hairline and around the mouth and nose. Use lots of cold water for rinsing. It's a tonic for your skin, adds the lovely actress. Wow. Then follows like sprinkle a few drops of your favorite cologne into the final rinse of water after sudden your fancy frillies. Your it creates a gentle seductive odor when you pass by, as flattering as a swish of your taffeta petticoats. <laughs> oh, these were the days. It's what interesting. Um, if you uh saw the second of these um, news hounds that are related to the articles. I cover um, Esmeralda Galan giving the same sort of advice. You know, they'd often be like, okay, we're going to put you in the paper. What are we going to say about you? Well, you're an actress, but we don't really care about women. So how about you give some women advice on how to wash their face and look pretty for men? And that's really what it was. It was, uh, it was a vehicle for that. I, I thought I'd show you a little bit about who uh, she was. I'm still going to close a couple of these other times. Oh, baby, boo, ba, 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 be. So... Here we go, hit number two. So this is uh, Saturday and Sunday at the the uh, Chackers Theatre, Cliftonia, Circleville, Ohio. Saturday and Sunday. Don't miss these two. The first one, Lua the Wilderness. Ooh, got Jean Peters, Jeffrey Hunter, and Constance Smith in. And it's in Technicolor. Who would want to miss that? But, of course, the one we want to see is Hunted in Hartford, Robert Pes- Preston, the Bride Comes to Yellow Sky by Stephen Crane, introducing Marjorie Steele. So this was a Huntington and Hartford production. The reason why Marjorie Steele gets her, her debut into films is because Huntington and Hartford makes the film, produces the film for her. The Minor Watson, distributed by RKO Radio Pictures, Inc., Sleepy Happy, Double Cross Cartoon. So that's what they want to do. And here we go. What does this say? This is in the independent record. Uh, 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 uh. And if we go up to the top. Whoa. No, no, no. Uh Uh-oh. We got problems. I got issues. The independent record. Helena Mont. Mount Helena, I suppose. Tuesday, 17th of March, 1953. In Hollywood. I don't have so, as much trouble as people think I do. That's luscious Marjorie still describing the career problems of a doll who married a millionaire. Her hubby may be hunted in Hartford, heir to the A&P grocery fortune, but Marjorie's working um, Goyle <laughs> status, uh, working Goyle status, uh, doesn't get the ha-ha, you must be kidding line in movie town's casting offices. Currently play playing a sexy charmer in No Escape, she told me, most people realize I'm serious about acting. There was a small part for her in Face to Face, a movie Hartford financed, and she's beaming. I got good reviews, and best of all, I wasn't criticized for being in one of my husband's pictures. It's a big personality switch for N- Nelson Eddy in his new nightclub act, Snappy Rhythm Numbers. Okay, so he comes on about Landa Turner and then Bing Crosby. Uh, but Hunted in Hartford, uh, she, uh, Marjorie Steele, is already uh, getting into the popular different columns. And she's getting a name for herself. And these all come within the same month, basically. Marjorie says she's becoming a star mostly on her own. Mostly! Not Marjorie says she's becoming a star on her own. No, someone lifted her up to this with money. Hollywood. Universal Press. Beautiful blonde Marjorie Steele, who has a husband earning $16,000 a day, uh, finally made a grade mostly on her own and became a movie star today. Marjorie admits, it's no disadvantage to be married to Hunterton Hartford, the handsome heir to all those A&P grocery stores, but the ex-cigarette girl uh, landed a co-starring role in No Escape with Lou Ayres. It was on my own, she said, after the producer saw her in another film. 
which was financed by her husband, so it wasn't on their own, was it? We don't even have any money in it, the excited actress bubbled. And that's wonderful, because I used to be offered leading role. Uh, I, I, I used to be offered leading roles, and then they'd say they needed the backing too. <laughs> oh, dirty. Of course, I'd be foolish to say it's a disadvantage to be Mrs. Hartford, she added. I'm able to do theatre work, and I had the money to get a nice dress for this movie. I hate the poor little rich girl routine. I'm grateful to Hunt. I wouldn't have had many of these opportunities without him. Every beginner needs a push by somebody who's interested in her. But the obstacle uh, that some people think um, I'm a dilettant, dilettant. Ooh. I work hard at my trade. I work hard at my trade more than the average actress. I don't sit around Schwab's drugstore. I have to work twice as hard to convince people I'm serious. Hartford produced two movies, Hello Out There and Face to Face, in which his wife had supporting roles. He also helped her get a lead in a local stage theatre production of Twelfth Night, or what you will. But she said her attempt at Shakespeare got terrible critical reviews. <laughs> I wanted to commit suicide. But the new... Sorry about laughing about that. But the New York reviews for Face to Face were wonderful she said, and hauled them out. Only one of the critic raves about her pert-nosed actress mentioned uh, she's a wife of... Oh, no! No, 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 no. Again, it did it again. I hate this. That was annoying. Annoying! Ah! Ah, producer, but she gracefully added, I don't mind that. If you're Jennifer Jones marrying David Sh Shelsnick, that's all right. But when you're unknown, it's different. People think I didn't act until I married Hunt, but I've been in the theatre since I was 14. Recently, I've done five plays in summer stock, two television shows and two radio shows, and I got them on my own. The new star also paints. She's having a woman art show in New York, February the 9th. And I got that on my own too. Oh yeah, I bet you did. Just happens that your husband is on the art scene, opening galleries and stuff. Yeah. Marjorie met the young millionaire when she was selling cigarettes at Sea Rose Nightclub. There you go. So... That's interesting, isn't it? Now, here we go to another. Now, this is where I first came across Marjorie Steele, because this is in Esma, Esmeralda Gulland's uh, nightclub, the Montrose Club in London. And it includes uh, Pietro Arnegoni, who appears in a couple of um, the articles that I've written in the Black Hand series. And as you see, it says forgers. And there's a reason behind that. This is from the Evening Standard in the UK. And it's the 18th of December. I think it's uh, 1954, but I will have to check this. Yeah, 1954. 18th of December, 1954. It's a Saturday. Forgers. Italian artist Pietro Anigoni stopped to work on his portrait of the Queen and went to a Christmas come farewell dinner party at the Montrose Club off Hawkins Street. Now, if you saw uh, News Hound, I think it was number 12, I actually go to Hawkins Street, go to the Montrose Clubs, two little muse cottages that Esmeralda Gulland bought and turned into the Montrose Club. They're in a really quiet area of London. Um, high class area of London. You, I, I, you can't even imagine how they got away with them being like uh, some sort of night like, dining facility, except for the fact that everybody was extremely rich who went there. Um, Montreal Club. Then he started drawing again, forging signatures. He and fellow guest Mrs. Huntington Hartford, actress Marjorie Steele, found that they both had the same hobby of forgery. Hobby. <laughs> Said Mrs. Hartford, 
My three sisters and I are all very good at copying signatures. I used to forge notes so that I could get the uh, get a holiday from school. Anagoni carefully copied the signature of millionaire Mrs. Hartford. So did Mrs. Hartford. And no one else at the table could tell which was the original. Here are the three signatures. I love that I found this and this is exists. Good luck. Here we go. This is the genuine George Huntington Hartford the second signature at top. This is the forgery by his wife. It's quite good. Very heavy, isn't it? Very heavy. And this is by the artist Anagoni. Anagoni is basically exact. I mean, it's really hard. That's unbelievably exact. I'm surprised that they didn't say, well, those two are the obvious and this one's a... Still, they're all very good. Lax Drive. After dinner, Mrs. Hartford practiced, uh, Mr. Hartford practiced his hobby of reading characters by handwriting. Yeah. While the rest of the ten guests sit their um, Chianti and coffee, he analyzes Anagoni's character. Brilliant, but lack of drive towards any particular goal. A scientific outlook. Slightly temperamental. Before going to the party given by businessman Mr. Philip Lasky, Anagoni went to see how work was progressing on his first attempt at theatrical decor. He has redesigned the interior of the former New Torch Theatre Club as a Christmas present for the new owner, Mrs. Esme Noel Smith. It's a Christmas present, apparently. She covers it all up afterwards. I mentioned this. She covers up all of his... He does it as a, a gift for her to bring in people, and she covers it all up. So whether that's to do with a dispute with him, he had met her in Italy when they were holding in Italy, and he had met um, uh, Esmeralda in Italy, and had decided that Esmeralda was uh, so wonderful and beautiful that he wanted to paint her. And she said, instead, why don't you paint my club? And that's what he did for a Christmas present in 1954. The painting is being done by Lord Plunkett's cousin, Mr. Tim Widborne, an Anagoni pupil. That's the guy I was trying to remember in one of the other previous uh, news hounds. He's Anagoni's main pupil, is Tim Widborne. Um, on the lines of Medieval Apprentice for the last six years. Well, that's very interesting. I don't think that's anything to do with it. And they were guests of Philip Lasky as well. I might go and check that later. And um, this is interesting. So, as you see, Hunting and Hartford wasn't only on the uh, scene in Manhattan or in Sea Rose or in LA, etc. Uh, George Hunted and Hartford was also um, uh, in London. And this is where I came across him. I came across him while investigating the Black Hand series, while investigating the nightclub murders, while investigating sexual compromise operations of Horace Dibbin. And part of the reason I came across him was his name gets mentioned um, in this book, which is a Stephen Wood Ward scapegoat. They all loved him, but when it came down to it or whatever, they all killed him. You know, I, I can never remember what the... It's such a silly... If they just Stephen Ward scapegoat, that would have been enough. But they all loved him. But when it, it, it all fell apart, they killed him, basically. It's called something like that. Hey. Ooh, I'm dangerous. Right, okay, so... So, 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 so. I'm just trying to work out how best to read this. I think I should probably put that over there so I can read it. And this uh, talks about Horace Dibbin, some of the connections. And I felt that this was a really important bit to read. Um, really important bit to read. After the wedding day, champagne reception at the Black Sheep, Mariella met Stephen Ward again. 
Stephen was fascinated by Mariella, says Nancy Gillespie, before adding, she was very, she was every fantasy except one. He could never make her a lady. Mariella had already marked out her life and no one was going to change that. Gillespie, the one-time Sunday Express gossip columnist, lover of Mayfair Hollywood stars and aristocrats, she married um, Christine Keeler's lover, Michael Lampton, told me Stephen did try to fix up Mariella with Hunted and Hartford. He thought that being American, Hunt wouldn't mind the rougher edges. Hod was in on the idea with him. So Horace Dibbin was trying to set up his own wife with Hunterton Hartford. Just like Horace Dibbin was trying to set up his own wife with loads of other people, really powerful people, why she's involved in the perfume affair, why she was smuggled out of America with JFK. It's Hod Dibbin. Horace Dibbin is setting her up with these people, really uh, at his sex parties and through his connections at his sex parties. And we'll discuss that in later episodes of Black Hand. Stephen Ward knew all about the man he thought he would give Mariella status and cash, if not a title, the title he craved for all his female friends. As it was, George Huntington Hartford, one of the world's richest men and a fan of Hot Dibbin's sex party, found 18-year-old Mariella a little on the old side. Huntington Hartford was heir to the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, the American AMP, the largest supermarket chain in the world, and the first supermarket chain. Now, what what you really want to note here is that again says eighteen year old Mariella a little bit too on too on the old side because Huntington Hartford's sexual profile would uh, be considered. Um, the same thing um, if you look at FBI profiling methods he'd, he'd probably come under the same category as Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell as sadistic preferential paedophiles uh, he, I, I think he uh, his ra- age range of preference uh, for girls would be between 14 and 17 and this is the same uh, for a lot of different uh, people who are on that spectrum on that profile definitely the same for um epstein and for glenn maxwell a pleasure seeker he indulged his tastes in the bahamas where he created paradise island it was all aesthetic buildings painted strawberry ice cream shades and many many millions of dollars spent in the huntington hartford's home some of the bedrooms were equipped with two-way mirrors he created the island's ocean club, his own Xanadu for monastic stones that William Randolph Hearst had been unable to use at his epic monument of himself at San Simeon uh, on the Californian coast, but lovingly stored in Florida warehouse. He knew Barry Stonehill, whose family based themselves in Nassau, Salvador Dali, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, and America's Vice President Richard Nixon. He would spend time with the heiress Doris Duke and Barbara Hutton um, and movie stars Marilyn Monroe, too pushy like a high-class hooker, and Lana Turner, despite saying the actress was past her prime when he met her. The first of his four wives was Marjorie Steele, an inspi- aspiring actor when they married in 1949. She was a teenager, hunted in Hartford like Prime. Okay, so they, they note again about his association with Salvador Dali, uh, Duke and Duchess of Windsor, and Richard Nixon. Very interesting. Doris Duke, Barbara Hutton, and Marilyn Monroe. And he states about Marilyn Monroe, uh, he states about this a couple of times, uh, too pushy like a high-class hooker. That's what that's what he, he he said, but but she was um, a force to be reckoned with with Marilyn Monroe on her own. She was very she knew what she wanted, and Lana Turner, who was past her prime, and this is the the thing he says: Huntington Hartford liked prime, liked prime meant under eighteen. That's what they meant. Uh, also, uh, the, Douglas uh, Thompson, who writes this book, I think his name Thompson. Um, makes a mistake by saying the first of his four wives was Marjorie Steele. She was the second of his four wives. Uh, as you heard earlier, Mary Lee Epling was the first of his four wives. Um, so so that is a mistake and must be noted. Now, this book, Stephen Ward's Scapegoat, has some mistakes. 
um, less mistakes than uh, Lillian Pisaccini's Novotny papers, or whatever it's called. She's a suspicious one. She, she uh, serializes her book for the Mirror, and the Mirror basically made up Mary Ellen Novotny and Horace Dibbins' backstory and publicized them. So I think it's still the, the continuation of an op, or at least the rundown of an op. Uh, throughout the 1950s, employees would approach young women on the street on his behalf. In London, Stephen Ward, sketch bad in hand, did that for him. He also sketched a drawing of a girl being pleasured around the world by a machine for Hunter and Hartford, who gave it to a, a friend of Kim Waterfield. So Stephen Ward actually uh, drew a sketch of a girl being pleasured around the world by a machine for Hunter and Hartford. That's bizarre uh sounding but uh and is of te uh, jeffrey epstein's tech lust <laughs> you could call it tech lust but this is really interesting throughout the 1950s employees would approach young women on the streets on his behalf just like Galay maxwell was sent out to do it's almost like Galay maxwell and jeffrey epstein knew um the 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 best way to do it was in the hunted and hartford style and knew probably about hunted and hartford at least through stories on the grapevine of the elite um uh, and jeffrey epstein's similarities to hunted and hartford are unbelievable in many of his uh, respects, including uh, his level. Like I say, he wasn't as amazing as a business mind, but he was amazing at being able to connect people who were unconnected before um, and influencing people to be with other people was something he was very good at. And that's something Jeffrey Epstein did a lot of uh, networking. Networking, Hunter to Hartford had a big network. The billionaire American uh, liked girls in the flesh, as did producer Harry Allen Towers, who invited, who, who was invited to a London party thrown by Hunter and Hartford. There, with Stephen Ward and Hod Dibbin, was Mariella. She was instantly invited for tea at Sweet Twelve at Weymouth House. He personally came down and escorted her to the elevator. In the elevator, he promised to make Mariella a star. She didn't believe it for a moment, but she went round the next day, met Harry and his mother, and went to bed with the Amer with an American investor who appeared to believe that um, that was what she was there for. She never had tea. Instead, the wily Harry produced his battered typewriter and punched out one-page contract, no typos. He bought her um, a Pan Am economy ticket for New York. Mariella, so, Mariella, when she gets smuggled out, after she gets discovered um, it, as having an affair with JFK, alleged affair with JFK, um, between the time he becomes president, uh, he, uh, he's he's elected, president and becomes president so in between that time so the december and before the inauguration he she snuck out by the cia and the fbi now that was set up through hunted and hartford sex party where he introduces her to harry allen towers and it's all part of the network so hunted and hartford was the root of that uh part of the root of that uh sexual compromise operation and not many people will know that. Not many people will know that Harry Allen Towers was introduced to uh, Mariella Novotny and Hod Dibbin through Hunted and Hartford sex parties in London. And that Hunted and Hartford had the same MO uh, for picking up young girls as did Jeffrey Epstein. So we're going to go um, to the 18th of December, 1960. And here we go. I'm going to up a little bit. There's Hunt, George Hunt in Hartford II. And, and I mean, maybe it's just because I know already his future, his character, but number he looks like he's empty. He looks like an empty shell. He, he just, yeah, I mean, a lot of his narcissism. And she looks like, you know, this American acting doll type. Very big features, this lady got. Very young looking. And this is Marjorie Steele smiles happily with grocery chain store Hunted and Hartford three days after 1949 wedding. So there she's 17, 18, something like that. And this is a, a, a an interesting article from Fort Worth uh, 
uh, Star Telegram from uh, 1857 1960. So this is when they're approaching divorce. Their second marriage is approaching divorce. This was his favorite marriage by far. By far, may I say. Uh, again, just so you understand. And this article is called How Much Is a oh, Wife Worth? Ooh, bitchy. Eh? Okay. A few weeks ago, Marjorie Steele, a former cigarette girl at Sea nightclub, Hollywood, um, asked the New York court to award her a record $25 million in alimony. Miss Steele, 31, is the estranged actress wife of Hunter to the Heart for 48, whose fortune from the Great Atlantic Pacific Tea Company grocery store is estimated at $50 million. This has been shrinking every decade quite rapidly. All of his projects failed. The Hartfords have been married 11 years and have two children, Kathy 10 and Jackie 8. Remember, his first wife is where he had um, uh, Juliet with, who stayed with him for the rest of his life, really, um, when he got older and drug addled. Mrs. Hartford, a shapely, beautiful brunette from San Francisco who became a competent actress with a husband's limitless um, financial backing, he had, did have a limit, has accused Hartford of misconduct with half a dozen women. True. Uh, for this and her almost 12 years of marriage, she wants half of his fortune. Does this woman deserve approximately two million of dollars for each year of matrimony spent with the A and P heir, or is this penalty a husband must pay for proven guilty for being proven guilty? Hartford was quick to enter general denial of the misconduct charges. <laughs> what this does raise is the age-old question of how much is a wife worth. When Marjorie Steele began going with Hunt Hunterton Hartford in 1949, she was often penniless. On many occasions, she borrowed uh, a few dollars from the president of the June Allison Fan Club to another uh, and um, other movie-struck young hopefuls she knew in Hollywood. She met Hartford through Charlie Chaplin Jr. She was working to pay through her actor's lab, a drama workshop. She wanted desperately to become a screen star. Young Hartford was so smitten with her that he financed a film for the future bride called Tough Assignment. Later, he helped to get other parts. Now, what they don't mention here is that she met him through Charlie Chaplin Jr. And Charlie Ch Charles Chaplin Jr., Charlie Chaplin's son, was going out with her at the time and he was they were engaged to be married and it was uh charlie chaplin himself who went to marjorie Steele and persuaded him to leave his own son and get with um george hunterton hartford the second amazing charlie chaplin himself doesn't mention that there it's quite a a, a way um, quite an important uh, addition to leave out. In addition to acting opportunities, she also owes um, to Hartford a dozen and luxurious, uh, a dozen years of luxurious living. For she herself points out a recent affidavit to the court, uh, a New York Supreme Court. Hartford maintains a large ocean-going yacht, homes in Paris, London, Palm Beach, Nassau, and New York. He lives in a manner befitting a multimillionaire. Because he introduced her to a world she had never known before, Hartford will probably have to support his ex-wife on the same high style. To her marriage, Marjorie Steele contributed love, children, comfort, companionship and care. She had nothing to do with founding or increasing the Hartford fortune, but she wants half of it in alimony. Will she get it? Probably not $25 million, but probably a huge settlement, provided, of course, that she can prove her husband guilty as charged. For success in such divorce action is a prerequisite to a generous alimony award. Alimony or marriage? For example, take Eleanor Holm Billy Rose divorce. Okay, so they're going to talk about someone else's divorce there, and I'm not really that interested about the actual subject of 1960s, what is a wife worth? So um, they, they, they talk about all of these things. Oh, this is interesting. Here are the women who hit alimony jackpot. Bobo Rockefeller. They, Bobo. Her name was Bobo. Oh, my God. 
uh, a triple O divorce settlement from Winthrop Rockefeller in 1954. Hmm. Um, Greta Peck. Hmm. Betsy Kelly, Nancy Sinatra. Ooh. So there were some big, uh, big people uh, involved in that. Anyway, so that's a bit about Hunted and Hartford. And we're going to uh, change tack a little bit. We're going to go to the uh, other part of this article because this isn't only about Huntington Hartford. This article isn't only about Huntington Hartford. It's about Huntington Hartford's connections too. And Ivor Bryce is really important. Ivor Bryce is one of the people who created James Bond. He met, as it says, in 1917, Bryce met Ian Fleming um, and his brothers on a beach in Cornwall. The fortress builders generously invited me to join them, and I discovered their names were Peter, Ian, Richard, and Michael in that order. The leaders were Ian and Peter. I gladly carried out their exact and exacting orders. They were natural leaders and men, both of them, as, uh, as uh, later history would prove, and it speaks well for them that there was room for both Peter and Ian in the platoon. Now, he, he, he t they talk like army men because they are army men. This is Ivor Bryce, and Ivor Bryce it becomes eventually Hunted and Hartford's um, brother in law. So, he, Ivor Bryce will marry um, down here. Let's, let's, oh, let's go down here. Yes, this is all very interesting, and we will, we will talk about this. Um, in general, uh, but basically, he marries. I can't, I can't see it here, but he marries Josephine Huntington Hartford. And Ivor Bryce is an extremely, as you see here, OSS 991. That's his OSS, the o o Operational Strategic Services, um, I think it was called, division. And the OSS was an American uh, precursor to the CIA uh, during the war, started off during the war. And Ivor Bryce was the only British national, foreign national, full stop, who was a member of the OSS. He was that important. He was that really that important, extremely important um, guy. And he's well worth a look. So we're going to look through some of this. Ivor, Ivor Bryce, um, like I say, married into the Hunted and Hartford family and Josephine uh, Hunted and Hartford who was quoted earlier as Josephine Bryce um, uh, commenting on her husband, uh, on her brother. Um, she was much more successful than Hunter and Harford. She used her uh, wealth that she had got from the AMP grocery chains to um, invest in horses and other things like that. And she was um, made a hell of a lot of money in doing that. Hell of a lot of money. Um, so she was interesting in her own right. And they were very, very uh, linked people. Very interesting people. So I'm going to read a little bit here. And this is from um, Desperate Deception, uh, which is a uh, book that covers a lot of these people. And this is massively important. I'm going to reduce my own screen so I can read it easier. And this talks about Ivor Bryce. And I think it's very important to understand what Ivor Bryce was involved in. Lippmann's brother-in-law, Ivor Bryce, worked in the Latin American Affairs section of BSC, uh, which was run by Dick, Dickie Coit, known in the office as Coitus Interruptus, because there was little evidence of a German plot to take over Latin America. Ivor found it difficult to excite, excite Americans about the threat. In his 1975 memoir, You Only Live Once, Memories of Ian Fleming, Bryce wrote, Sketching out trial maps of the possible changes on my blotter, I came up with one showing the probable relocation of territories that would appeal to Berlin. It was very convincing. The more I studied it, the more it made sense. I, it were a genuine German map of this kind to be discovered and publicized among the American firsters, what a commotion it would be caused. Now, this is about the British BSC that were located in America using Bryce to try and um, turn Americans against Latin American countries, in this case, Cuba. 
And this is massively important to the future because Cuba and all of the stuff that happens then and the failed uh, coup attempt and then JFK's assassination are kind of all bundled up in, in roughly the same area. You know, there's a lot of things happening down there. And that was partially caused by Ivor Bryce himself in the start because they were on, Cuba and, and America were on good relationships. Uh, good terms but the bsc were actively trying to um make america focus on things like that so partially so they'd focus away from europe as well but also because um they believed that it uh it would be a strategic advantage if their allies were placed here and here and here and here intrepid approved the idea the skill team at Station M, the phony document factory in Toronto run by SOE's Eric Matchwitch, uh, took only 48 hours to produce a map slightly travel stained with use, but on which the Reich's chief map makers would be prepared to swear was made by them. In Roosevelt's hand, the document had it desired effect and Congress dismantled the last of the neutrality legislation. Do you understand what that means? Congress, because of the map made up by Ivor Bryce, dismantled the last of the uh, neutrality legislation aimed at Cuba and Latin America. So that meant it gave way for more operations to happen there and eventually the Cuban-Americans like sort of mix uh, the bashing of heads that came from that. Um, so it's extremely interesting. Uh, the BSC are extremely interesting in general. Um, oh no, yeah. And here we go. Um, this is pretty important. I'll give you a flash of my screen there. This is pretty important. <laughs> Spy, Spin, and the Fourth Estate, British Intelligence and the Media. This is an interesting book written by Paul Leshmar. And this talks about someone else who was in the BSE alongside him. Someone who also helped with the creation of uh, James Bond, a guy called Ernest Cunningham. So he was in this group, Ian Fleming, um, Ivor Bryce, uh, Ernest Cuneo, and others. And these would be in the the um, social circles of Huntington Hartford too, because of course Ivor Bryce is related now to Huntington Hartford, and they spend a lot of time. They even um, buy their own island. Uh, Bahami, Bahamian Island as well, Josephine and Ivor Bryce. So they have Golden Eye. Is it Golden Eye? Oh no, that's uh, that's another Bahamian Island that's bought by Ian Fleming. This was called something else. What was it? Um, oh, it's it's it comes up later. It's um, oh god, my brain. So Ian Fleming's was uh, island was called Golden Eye, and oh wow, we'll get there soon. I'll remember it. But this talks about the BSC and what they were doing. BSC may have represented a large single covert operation, represented the largest single covert operation in British intelligence history. Ian Fleming himself once wrote that James Bond is highly romanticized version of a true spy and then pointed to William Stevenson as the real thing. At the height of its operation in late 1941, there were many hundreds of agents and many hundreds of discreet supporters. Its power was, suffi uh, was sufficient that it finally stirred the suspicions of the head of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. America's embryonic intelligence community was heavily in influenced by BSC. Many years later, CIA Executive Director David W. Carey confirmed that Sir William Stevenson had played a key role in the creation of the CIA. The attorney, Ernst Cunio, was the American liaison between British intelligence, the White House, the FBI, the Treasury, and the embryonic US intelligence services. He later noted, and this is really important, I quote this, given the time, the situation, and the mood, it is not surprising, however, that BSC also went beyond the legal, the ethical, and the proper. Throughout the neutral Americas, and especially in the U.S., it ran espionage agents, 
tampered with mails, tapped telephones, smuggled propaganda into the country, disrupted public gatherings, covertly subsidized newspapers, radios, and organizations, um, perpetuated forgeries, even palming off on the President of the United States, violated the Alien Registr uh, Registration Act, shanghaied sailors numerous times, and possibly murdered one or more persons in this country. So that's Ernest uh, Cunio quoted. Many uh, uh, other unofficial biographies and histories of BSC followed. William Stevenson's 1976 account of his former chief, William Stevenson, had been repeatedly uh, challenged for accuracy and stands charged with helping create a myth. The biography by H. Montgomery Hyde, 1989, is considered more accurate. For other more rounded view, see Neftali nineteen ninety three. So that's interesting anyway. Anyway, I love I love I get very excited when I start looking at sources because you never know what other books, what other pieces of work you're gonna find. But that Ernst Cunio, Ernest Cunio um quote is amazing. It explains that basically um these guys were working against America to trick America and they used people like Ivor Bryce for that. Ivor Bryce was employed for that and he was also a member of the OSS and they wanted to create America into something. And this was Ivor Bryce's um wife and this is from the New York Social Diary. And this is the Life and Times of Josephine Hartford part two. And you know it's it's worth noting so you can you can see all of these wonderful pictures of Josephine Hartford. As it would turn out, 1937 would be a very busy year for Joe. Her mother, the widowed and still very social Henrietta Hartford, would remarry three weeks after her own marriage to Barclay. Mrs. Hartford's new husband was Prince Guido Pignatelli. Mm. The wedding was much sensationalised in the press, given the age difference, and the groom's very fresh Reno divorce from his first wife, Constance Wilcox. Interesting. There you go. Look at that. A young George Huntington Hartford there with his mother. And they've cut out a lot of the other. I, I always find it really weird when they do this. They cut out everything else. So it's just these guys speaking. So they don't want you to see um, who they are. But this, I mean, is is very interesting to look through this. This is a very interesting, um, has some very interesting information in very interesting piece of history. I, I love I love it when things have stuff that's um properly written down uh at the time in handwriting, pictures from the time, uh, the people who were involved in all of these things. And there you go. Sadly Joe's marriage to Barclay would not last. Joe's final marriage was to a dashing Englishman, John Felix Charles Bryce, known as Ivor, in 1950. When Bry with Bryce, she would spend the next 35 years of her life. Ivor Bryce is a well-known figure in international circles, whose father had many for uh, made his fortune trade in guano. Educated at Eton, he served as a British intelligence officer during w World War Two. He actually served as an American intelligence officer, didn't he, if he's OSS. His cousin, Janet Bryce, married David Mountbatten, the third Earl of Milford Haven. Lord yeah. Mountbatten, wow. A great grand uh, um a great great grandson of Queen Victoria and Ivor uh, who remained childless, was very close to his cousin and her cousin. Well, as you as you see, ah, there you go, Xanadu, that's the name. So the, the Bahama, the, her villa, uh, and it's Xanadu, her villa on the New Providence Islands of Bahamas, which was right around the corner from Paradise Island, and then again around the corner from Golden Eye, which was the retreat of Ian Fleming. So they all had these Bahaman islands, um, and that could partially come from um, Ian Fleming being based in the Bahamas for a certain amount of time, along with Ivor Bryce during the war, and saying, okay, we like this very much, and then uh, Bryce helped Fleming to find a house there. They were very close friends, so he did that sort of thing and they helped each other out loads. So 
at Xanadu, her villa on New Providence, Bahamas, not far from her brother Huntington, uh, Huntington's Paradise Island Resort, developed from 1959. So she she was, as you see, they they didn't live in small places. These guys, extremely rich, of course. Um, it's extremely interesting. And so you get to see some of this, and this is Felix Letter was portrayed in various Bond films. As you see, their own life were represented within the Bond films. Uh, so also some of the names that were, were there too um, used were also part of the Bond films. And it's very interesting. Uh, very interesting indeed. So I wanted to show you that for that reason. But then why 007 left for the Bahamas? So this is uh, um, from 1963. I think it's November 1963, if I'm right. November 22nd, 1963. Oh, look at you. Miss World, Carol John Crawford. Well, anyway, this is uh, in the... Daily Herald newspaper, and it's a piece called Why 007 Left Bahamas, and it shows Mr. John Bryce, who's Ivor Bryce, tried to oust producer. Author Ian Fleming was not keen on writing a new story for a film about secret agent James Bond, it was said yesterday. When he discussed the idea with film producer Kevin McClory, Mr. Fleming suggested that one of two novels he had already written would make good James Bond films, a higher court judge was told. The novels he suggested were Diamonds of Forever and Live and Let Die, gimmickry. In a letter to Mr. McClory in April 1959, the 55-year-old author was said to have written, The trouble about writing something special for a film is that I haven't got a single idea in my head. If you were to decide on one of my books, I could probably embellish it with uh, my extra gimmickry. But, said Mr. W. L. Uh, Mars Joan QC for Mr. McClory, the film producer wanted the story about Bond, Agent 007 set in the Bahamas. Mr. McClory, age 39, claims he is responsible for a large part of the plot in Mr. Fleming's novel Thunderball, which is set in the Bahamas. The film producer, husband of heiress Bobo Sigrest, is claiming damages from Mr. Fleming and the publisher's Jonathan Cape. Mr. McClory also claims that his former business partner, financier John Bryce, told, uh, joined with Mr. Fleming to oust him, oust him as producer of the proposed Bond film. Um, and as his partner, he claimed damages for Mr. Bryce, who is counterclaiming for breach of contract. They were partners in a company called Xanadu Productions. Mr. Mars Jones said Mr. Fleming agreed to accept £50,000 worth of shares in Xanadu Productions in exchange for uh, in exchange the company were given the rights to make the first full-length James Bond film. In May 1959, the draft plot was submitted by Ernest Cunio, they spelled his wrong name, they put Kunko, a New York lawyer and business associate of Mr. Bryce. Beauty. It suggested the use of a plane and said that if British content, if the British um, content was large enough, uh, the film would qualify for a British grant. The draft plot also suggested that the plane would be borrowed from BOAC and scenes showing uh, the beauty of the Commonwealth could should be included, said the judge, Mr Justice Ungoy Thomas. A fascinating combination of the mercenary and romantic, the case goes on today. So this is why this is a case between a few people, including um, McClory and Bryce, um and this was about uh and i'm not sure if ian i think ian fleming is dead or is about to die or something along those lines at that time but basically they wanted to to film everything in bahamas for obvious reasons they're based there uh and they uh, after they make the bond um uh, there's different court cases 
uh, that that are basically people trying to wrestle the power and control of Bond and get a bit of extra money, and they do it. Now, um, oh, I'm gonna show you some stuff. Like we got to a certain point. Let's let's leave behind uh, Ivor Bryson a lot, and let's look at what we've got. So. Nowadays, you will find that Hunted and Hartford, 1911 to 2008, George Hunted and Hartford II, you find obituary notices. So, born April the 18th, 1911, in New York, uh, died May 19th, 2008, in Lifford, K. Bahamas, philanthropist, uh, financier, and author. Hartford was born into a life of wealth and privilege, and he attended. Uh, to use his substantial inheritance to make his mark on the world. At the end of it, all his fortune disappeared, and and the heir of the AMP supermarket millions was, at best, a laughing stock and, at worst, a forgotten pauper. Hartford saw himself as a patron of arts, found in the Gallery of Modern Art in New York City, the Huntington Hartford Foundation Artist Colony in California, the Huntington Hartford Theatre in Hollywood, Show Magazine, and other artistic ventures. Not one succeeded under his ownership. He founded the Hartford Model Agency. This was part of his uh, I'm Gonna Find Girls. Wrote and produced a Broadway adaptation of Jane Eyre. Flopped, put his wife into it, and his wife pulled out of it. It was so bad. And financed a Hollywood film for one of his ex-wives to star in. All failed. Hartford saw himself as a financer, founding the Paradise Island Resort in the Bahamas, an oil shale mining operation, and a graphology institute, and attempted to develop an automatic system for parking garages. His fortune continued to dwindle. Hartford also indulged his personal interests, spending lavishly on showgirls and actresses, including Marilyn Monroe, he claimed, yachting and nightclubs. Finally, when all was lost, he retreated to the Bahamas, where he spent the rest of his life quietly with his daughter, Juliet, on his first marriage, uh, Mary Lee Epling. Hartford had once fancied himself a writer, but aside from a failed stage play and a brief stint as a reporter for PM, a position that he actually purchased with the investment of the newspaper, he wrote little. Hartford's 1964 book, Art or Anarchy, was a lacerating diatribe against modern arts, including the work of Picasso, William Faulkner, and Tennessee Williams, which he maligned as vulgar, immoral, and without meaning, or value and there you go that's all you get George Huntington Hartford major bloody loser is <laughs> basically his obituary everything he did failed he never succeeded at anything he spent all of his money on girls not a surprise is it um but let's see some of these projects. So in 1960, in April 18th, 1960, you can see New York Times. I've got a couple of New York Times articles to finish out on before we, we have a conversation about this. So one of the things he did was 2D Group Opposes Park Restaurant. The directors of Fifth Avenue Association have voted unanimously against the proposal for a 500,000 sidewalk, for a pound a dollar sidewalk cafe and restaurant in Central Park. Um... And they basically said no to this idea. Uh, the idea was that of the cafe restaurant was proposed on March 13th by Hunted and Hartford, who offered to give the city a little more than $500,000 to underwrite the project. The proposal was accepted by Robert Moses with Mayor Wagner's approval. Mr. Moses will resign as park commissioner when he takes up his duty as president of the 1964's World Fair. Um, so the site of the Fifth Avenue is in the river. Basically, uh, they they wanted to build. He wanted to build this um, park, this little, like seated area in park, and and they agreed with it. And then everybody pulled out, and people just had to leave because it was so unpopular. Popular price proposed. Mister Hartford is a forty nine. Uh, oh, that's annoying. 
Sorry about that, everybody. Mr. Hartford is a 49-year-old grandson of George Huntington Hartford, founder of the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. He said he wanted to give a city, uh, the city a restaurant with a popular prices for indoor and outdoor dining in the park setting. Mr. Hartford said he believed the public should have the type of dining provided by cafes in Paris, Rome and Copenhagen. Mr. Hartford had previously announced plans to build a gallery of modern art um, on Columbus Circle and a dignified vacation resort on Hog Island at Nassau in the Bahamas for artists and writers, socialites and diplomats, teachers and scientists, sportsmen and students in an atmosphere of cultural enjoyment. And of course, he did do some of that, but none of it succeeded and none of it was what he wanted. So in by 1962, Bustling Bahamas, tourist is, uh, tourism is on the rise, and Nassau, um, out islands. Nassau, the Bahamas. Number of tourists who visit the island of New Providence, on which Nassau is situated, um, and surrounding out islands in the Bahamas, continues to rise each year, and 1962 looms is no exception to this rule. For the first nine months of 1962, Nassau registered 266 thousand six hundred ninety three vacationists or um a gain of almost six percent above nine month mark a year ago. Um also through August immigration authorities counted a total of eighty five thousand three hundred thirty one direct out island visitors or those entering the colony through port other than Nassau. So that's interesting. They're making a lot of, they're doing a lot there. And it's talk about the wonders and that's how um, uh, different um, areas. But it, it, what we're looking for, it's a little bit down here. The most elaborate, this under holiday complex, the most elaborate resort primping for its first full winter of operation is the $23, uh, $23 million Paradise Island project of Huntington Hartford. Just 50 minutes across Nassau Harbour by, Harbour by special boat, this holiday complex encompasses a French restaurant of 52 hotel rooms, lavish tropical gardens, a swimming pool, and superb tennis courts. An 18-hole championship Championship golf course at which Arnold Palmer is a professional will have nine holes playable by December the 1st. Nearby on the island, uh, Paradise Beach has a new restaurant, bar and other amenities. Also preparing for its first uh, for winter and then it talks about another place. But as you notice, it only has a 52 room hotel, which will be the end of his dream. So by 1964, March 9th, 1964, there's strange happenings going on, reported in the New York Times. Bahama bandit robs six of 750,000. American tourist victims loot mostly jewelry. Now listen to some of this. Nassau, Bahama Islands, March 8th. Four gunmen wearing silk stocking masks ambushed a taxi carrying six American tourists early today and robbed them of an estimated total of $750,000 in cash and jewels. The Americans, three couples, were returning from a casino at Nassau to their rooms at the Hunted and Hartford's Ocean Club Resort in Paradise Island in Nassau Bay. At 2 a.m., the taxi was bumped from the rear by another car, the police said, and the taxi driver got out to investigate. The four bandits then jumped out of the car, ordered the Americans out of the taxi, and rapidly took the women's jewels and the men's rings and wallets. The incident was over in 10 minutes. None of the victims were injured. The police identified the Americans as Mr. and Mrs. Garfield Icass and Mr. and Mrs. Irwin Berger of Washington and Mr. and Mrs. Howard of Gould, Cincinnati. Cincinnati, uh, Mrs. Berger, daughter of, wait a minute, it says, you got to go to the page nine. So as you see, this has a very interesting little piece. So that's where Nassau is. You can see how Cuba, Providence Island, come and held up a group. Mr. and Mrs. Cass. Mr. Cass is particular is partially retired real estate investor. And Mr. and Mrs. Gold were described as old friends of the Cass family. Miss, uh, Mr. Gold is a Cincinnati attorney. The taxi driver, Clarence Cunningham, told the police that the four men sounded like Americans. 
The four men sounded like Americans who robbed them. Sounds like it was a setup. Mr. Kenneman was ordered to lie on the road while the men robbed the passengers. When they finished, he said the men ran to their car um, where another man was waiting behind a wheel to sp and sped off. The car was later found abandoned on the side of the street near hold-up scene. It had been stolen earlier in the day. The police assigned detectives to watch the airport here and many docks from which the bandits could escape the ship. The Americans had been to Bahaman Island, uh, Bahaman Club, Nassau's only gambling casino at the time of the holdup. They were being driven to the um, from the casino to the docks where launches from the ocean clubs are available to take guests to the island about 100 yards away. Less than one thousand dollars in cash. Very interesting. Nassau, March the eighth. Police Lieutenant Colonel Nigel Morris said the amount of cash involved in the robbery was less than a thousand dollars. The major pieces of jewelry taken, the police official said, was two hundred and fifty thousand dollar diamond ring owned by Mrs. Cass. The robber uh, robbers also took a necklace, bracelet, and two earrings from her. He said. Hartford bought Island. Mr. Hartford, the AMP food chain heir, bought Paradise Island, formerly Hog Island, and transformed it into a $25 million resort with hotel, golf course, swimming pools, and a garden. When the Ocean Club opened in 1962 and 1,000 people attended the party, the club had 48 rooms and four large suites, and the minimum daily rate is $45 a person. The resort covers 700 acres. Interesting, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar ring back in nineteen sixty four. That's insane. That's a million, like a few million today, isn't it? Yes, it is. And here you go. Not long afterwards, so you're talking. That's March, and it only took another six months odd for him for Hunted and Hartford to get fed up officially. Hartford to sell Paradise Island. AMP Air offers resort. In Bahama for $32 million, found venture costly. Huntington Hartford's Paradise Island, about a quarter mile off the coast of Nassau, in the Bahamas, is for sale. The Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company Air is asking about $32 million for his favourite playground. But his broker, John Machio uh, of Al Hurd uh, Inc. in Los Angeles, conceded that the sale price would be less than that. Yes, it was. The resort island, Mr. Machio says, has never been profitable operation with his former um, formal gardens, beautiful beaches, golf course, marina, yacht harbour and 52-room hotel. The hotel is much too small to pay for the luxury extras the island offers, Miss Machio said. You can't pay for men like Pancho Gonzalez, the island tennis pro, and Gary Player, the golf pro, with uh, 52 paying guests, he declared. Mr. Harford is looking for a major chain to buy the property, according to a uh, realty man, because the island, which is four miles long and three and a quarter miles wide, needs one or more large hotels. Nassau site included. The sale also included the block square site in Nassau that contains a boat landing and a restaurant. That tract alone is said to be worth $2 million. Mr. Hartford was once quoted as saying, the day I live for is the day someone mentions my name and doesn't immediately say AMP Air. He envisioned his Paradise Island as a symbol of peace when he purchased a 700-acre property from the late Axel, Dr. Axel um, Wenergren, a Swedish industrial in 1959. The island was originally named Hog Island um, from the large number of wild hogs that once roamed the property. Mr. Hartford changed the name to Paradise. The purchase price was $13.5 million, but the buyers spent millions more in developing the society uh, resort that the island is today. The island has a separate beach for daytime tourists and other facilities, including 18 hole golf course, five boats, limousines, buses, tennis courts, and a large swimming pool. And again, it shows, I believe it shows Paradise Island. There you go. And there you go. Hartford sells Paradise Island. So two years later, Oh, a year and a half later after putting up for sale, he sells it. Um, and uh, it is gone. And the price is reported to be 
14 million dollars rather than the 32 million dollars that he had asked for and um there you go there you go so we are back one more time I'm not going to continue reading through that, actually. I was going to read through that. But instead, I'm going to talk to you about Huntington Hartford. So, George Huntington Hartford II was an incredibly interesting guy. Um, not interesting for good reasons. Interesting because he was one of those people within history that repeats itself. A billionaire philanthropist, sex pest, uh, sex addict, who decides um, to use his fortune um, to you know, set up some sort of uh, various different uh, locations for him to have sex in. That's basically it. He liked young girls. He liked girls between, it seems, between the age of uh, 14 and 17. 18 was too old. Uh, he had multiple resorts, including an island resort, a lot of money. And he had a lifestyle that um, was very similar to Jeffrey Epstein. Having people going out looking for girls for him in that respect. Like I say, he wasn't as much of a banker and a money man. He wasn't very good in actually making money. Epstein was very good in making people money at times. You know, he wasn't a failure. Epstein succeeded in many different ways. Um, that's not been publicized. Of course, all the sex stuff gets publicized about Epstein. Um, and that's what really Hunter and Hartford and Epstein have in common. They're both um, really interestingly similar in regards to their sexual um, preferences. That's not only women age, but it seems to be how they acted, how they uh, approached girls. And Hunted and Hartford, he had older wives. They always failed. When when the wives got older, they failed. So he was also notorious as um, a, a notorious cheat. So he was cheating on all of his wives um, with much younger girls. So I think the wives were just kind of a thing to to make it look like he was living a normal life. And then all, he knew all of these other people. He, he entered into the world of London and the sex parties in London. And he's very similar to his sex parties were very similar to the, those of Hod Dibbins and others. And he is very interesting person to examine. And of course, his brother-in-law is Ivor Bryce, massively linked um in intelligence in respect of intelligence and used his influence and his great wealth that he got from marion josephine huntington hartford um uh to basically help create james bond and the idea that these wonderful intelligence agents are handsome clever and will always win in the end and that was something that james bond was all about and not surprised, it was made by a load of intelligence, heavy, heavily linked intelligence men, with uh, all, all who had basically the same belief in their own superiority. And there's a lot of interesting facts about all of these people. And uh, maybe maybe it will go further into it eventually, into uh, a lot of Ivor Bryce's um interaction with stuff but i this is a really important i mean there's so many the the the, the world of horace divin sex parties included some amazingly interesting characters that repeat today they repeat you know we really do believe we're these new creatures we come we get born and we're like so much different from the older generation we're not we're not so much different the same characters reoccur over and over again and in this case george hunterton hartford is the same character as Jeffrey Epstein, and there'll be another one again in the future, probably already alive now. And they'd repeat the same patterns, do the same things, because there's only a certain number of things you can do in life. Um, but there were similarities as well. 
uh, in education and the way they're brought up. And it's very interesting. I, I would, I, you know, I would go as far to say that it's like, it's almost, if it turned out that George Huntington Hartford II was actually Jeffrey Epstein's um, like father, he had uh, like an illegitimate child and denied knowledge of it, and he'd been brought up as an Epstein and all that, it wouldn't surprise me at all. It would be like, oh, well, you could spot that from genetics. And, you know, you, you wonder, is that something? Is it with Huntington Hartford? Was it his father's complete uh, disdain for his children? Was it his mother's complete overbearing nature? Was it those things that changed Hunter, made Huntington Hartford who, who he was? Or was it a collection of that with genetics mixed in? Expe negative six-year experience in school and then constantly being laughed at as new money and caring about it that much that caused Huntington Hartford to be so stunted developmentally when it comes to emotional aspects of his being, which were lacking, seriously lacking. That guy was like a big baby, Till the moment he died, you know, when you hear, when you read the full uh, Vanity Fair story, I was going to go through a couple of other bits of the Vanity Fair story. You should go read it yourself. It's linked within um, uh, the article that's on Limited Hangout, the fifth of the Black Hand series. And it's a really interesting article and it really shows you how pathetic Huntington Hartford is. And it also gives you a clue to how the press you know, react and, and publicize these people after their power is gone. Their power is dwindled, but they're still doing the same thing. They're still making him look like poor Huntington Hartford, poor this, poor that. But Huntington Hartford was a groomer of young girls. Huntington Hartford used his power and sway to cheat on nearly everybody and become uh, a, a drug addict. I can imagine if those are the things we know about, if the things we know about are uh, Stephen Ward grooming young girls for him on the streets of London and stuff like that, and uh, taking part in Horace Divin sex parties, I promise you the real Huntington Hartford life was even more disgusting than you can imagine, and there could be potentially a lot more stuff that came from it. So I can hear... Uh, the baby crying in the distance and my family life calling me. So I want to thank you today for coming to Newshound with me. Um, this is a very special show for me because uh, I created this, made this. I, it's very personal. Um, and I really do thank the people who put in the time to watch it because a lot of these episodes are like an hour and a half long, two hours long, and it's not for everybody, I know that. Um, but I want people to learn something and to go on the adventure with me that I'm going through because being an investigative journalist is an adventure. You go through loads of different newspapers and you discover loads of different things. You go through loads of different sources and you discover loads of different things. And I want you to come on that adventure with me. So you can find my work on Unlimited Hangout, Black Hand series. This series, this uh, this actual article will be on uh, the original Jeffrey Epstein, will be on um, Unlimited Hangout. You can find my work on uh, johnnyvenmore.com and fungimonkey.com as well. And I really do want to thank you if you could support my work that's wonderful you can find links on funky monkey and johnny bedmore for dot com for doing that subscribe to my uh rockfin channel you can tip me for rockfin if you want um i do need support because this work is very time intensive to write these articles took a very long time uh, once upon a time i wanted to be an investigative journalist and i thought i could just like spend a week researching stuff and then i've written an article and i get like an article or maybe even day i write an article opinion piece opinion piece opinion and people aren't interested in opinion pieces we've all got our own opinions and they all differ so much what we want is real information real fact real truth and this is what this is about and that only happens i can only do this with your help and your support because if i can't afford to do this i gotta go and do other things um to to actually be able to support my family and put in uh to my own family so I, I love you all, really do appreciate your time. And I want you to go out and do a bit of research of your own on these characters, learn about them because there's loads of really interesting literature out there to read and loads of interesting books. But for now, from New Sound and me, Johnny Vedmore, goodbye. And generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina and so on, so if we penetrate the cabinets.